Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Why Are You an Entrepreneur? I'm Maureen Edwards. I'm the founder of Eight Simple Steps and the creator of this weekly show. And for those of you tuning in for the first time, this is where I bring you rock star entrepreneurs who are making things happen out there in the business world, who are here to share some best practices, some words of wisdom, and some inspiration. Because I think when we all think about the entrepreneurial journey, it's not easy. And it takes a village, and I'm bringing the village to you. And tonight's no exception. I have Laurel Hoffman with me. She is the CEO and founder. Laurel, do you want to tell everybody the company you have created? Yes, um, it's named Contemporary Fashion Education. And the goal with my business is to bring the procedures that were developed during the First and Second World War here in the United States now used throughout the global fashion industry. Uh, even in the Paris houses, they use these methods. And they are easier and better than home sewing. Many people think home sewing, I mean, the industry is down and dirty. But the truth of the matter is, when you look at high end in the industry, the clothing is exquisite. And anybody can learn this. My books present this. Scaled down, you can use it with just basic equipment in the home you don't need anything more than a total sewing machine that's what okay. i'm doing awesome so tell me why have you chosen to to do this entrepreneurial path what what is keeping you going having a business like this the people i meet i'm meeting the most interesting people my husband son and daughter tend to be very quiet and shy but i'm not that way i'm very much uh gregarious and i like to meet all different kinds of people and because of what i'm doing i am meeting people that absolutely fascinate me that i would know any other way they're in all different kinds of careers uh, many of them signed up for my classes which um presented the industry sewing because they wanted to make career clothing for themselves they weren't interested in going to the industry but the few that did want to go in the industry got extremely good jobs these are the procedures you need to know and you don't need to use a computer these are the basic procedures used in the industry that underlie the computer this is what you need to know to get a job in the industry if you want to do that to start an entrepreneurial business or to make better clothing for yourself i made everything i'm wearing i can't afford to make the clothes that i can buy i, mean, um, okay. I can't afford to buy the clothes i can make let's get that straight <laughs> Right. And it's one of a kind creations. When you think about it, you yes. can be creative with this, but it's also practical. And I think today with the economy and how expensive everything is, we just sit there and go, you know what? I think I'm going to bring it in house and, and do it myself. So, so what have oh. you found to be the greatest challenge being an entrepreneur and, and creating a small business? Um, the big problem is that most people think the industry is down and dirty, that home sewing is somehow better. It's not. It's over 100 years out of date and uh, it's slow. Um, I never made anything using home sewing methods before I went in the industry that I was really satisfied with. The only reason I went in the industry was because I needed money. I had been working in custom, but I wasn't making any money. I did work for Ann Packer Dini on the main line. She had a boutique that was parallel to those in Paris. We were clothing multimillionaires coming in from mainline, but the pay was terrible. I went in the industry simply for money and I expected it to be awful. It was completely the opposite. I was stunned at what I saw being made in the industry. I wound up making wedding gowns, working, heading up the uh, dis designing department, the couture design department at Alfred Angelo's, where we were uh, making wedding gowns we were selling for ten thousand a piece back in the late seventies. It would be thirty thousand now if you could get the lace, but probably you can't. And these gowns were being sold to daughters of the industrialists in New York City. They were having their weddings at St. Peter's and then taking the carriages over to um, the Ritz for their reception. And the, the gowns were just drop dead gorgeous. And I then realized that I wanted to learn everything I could in industry. I had my sample makers teach me how to sew. I was managed so I wasn't allowed to sew on the sewing machines. But I practiced when I was off the clock at noon and at home. And that's how I learned the sewing as well. And so, in, within three years, I was running factories. Yes. 
So as a, an entrepreneur, as you know, you go through this entrepreneurial journey, are there any things that you would do different and um, having started your business or the way it's running now? Is there anything out there that you, you feel like you should have done different or, or, or think back now and, and say, I, I should have done this differently? I don't think so. Um, what's amazing, I mean, when I look at my journey, I make an else in sense. I mean, I was a farm kid and I decided I was going to move to the city and start my own business and get in the industry. I must have been out of my mind, but I borrowed money. And of course, I didn't make any money. So I had all this to pay back. And I um, was nickel and diming. I mean, it was just it was stupid. I'm really stupid, but it worked. I mean, it's like nothing makes any sense when I look at my journey. Nothing. But I just went on instinct. And um Joseph Campbell, when he was a young boy, was at the um, went into the Natural History Museum in New York City and saw the totem poles. And he said, what is this all about? He spent his whole life studying that. And he is the author of The Power of Myth. And he says that all the big religions throughout the world say there's something we're supposed to do with our lives. And once we decide that, we step onto the path less, tra less traveled. And people come along and help us. You know, we, we come to a crossroad in the roads and we don't know where to go. And somebody will say, here, go this way. That's the way it's been for me. It doesn't make an ounce of sense. I don't believe any of it. But it keeps happening. So my suggestion to anybody who's thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or who is doing this is stay with your dream. Keep at it. One way or another, you'll find your way. And maybe it won't make much sense as you're going. And there have been plenty of times when it looked like it was time just to give up. It was hopeless. And then something would happen. Somebody would sign up for one of my classes and say, here, I can do this. I can help you with that. I mean, that's how I found my copy editor. She was one of my students. And it turned out she had a doctorate in Spanish and she was a language expert. And from her, I learned copy editing. My mother did it, so I knew something about it. But she really showed me how to do it. And it just went on like that. First one thing and another, strangest way. So, I mean, I can't explain it, but that's the way it happened. I just went on an instinct. I'm still doing it. And I tried to get various people to help me do this. And I got turned down by a couple of universities and by where I went for my business training. My son during the pandemic says, let's make some videos. So I am interested. And now it looks like I'm going to be teaching Teenagers in North and West Philadelphia. That's my goal is to bring help bring manufacturing back to Philadelphia. But people have to be trained how to sew. And it's like I said, I mean, I don't understand how this happens, but it just does. That's well, you I don't know, have any advice. I, <laughs> Do it. No, actually, you gave really good advice here because when I listen to you, I think some people have to remember that being an entrepreneur is is a combination real world experience i mean that's that's a big thing but at the end of the day it's gut like i make decisions with my gut and with facts and you're saying you had instincts you 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 knew it in yourself and you had faith in yourself and i think what you're saying to people out there is listen to that inner self and it right. may not be at this moment but eventually that moment comes eventually i said does. to myself nobody believes in me this was way back when. Nobody believes in me. Who believes in me? Not what I do. I'm the only one that does. But I think I can do this. Yeah. And I needed the money. And I couldn't really wasn't any good at doing anything else. I never could learn um, shorthand. I was horrible at that. I was a good typist. That was about it. You know, I had taken two two years at Syracuse University in journalism. and Actually finished two and a half years with all the courses I took. Transferred over into the art school. They dropped my fashion major. When I was there after a year and a half, I'd start over. And they dropped my major. I was furious. I was admitted over the phone by Parsons, can you believe? But they were a week ahead of me and I couldn't catch up. And besides, I was too upset anyway. I said, the heck with this. I'm getting out of this. And I worked for an insurance company uh, doing workman's comp for a couple of years. But I learned business skills. And then I said, hey, I don't really want to do this. So I moved to the city. And the whole thing's just crazy. But it works. It did. It did. Well, I'm still not where I want to be. What I want to do when I was running factories back before I was had children, 
the industry went offshore. And I met some of the most wonderful people I've ever known in North Philadelphia in the factory. I had to take a taxi two blocks from the train to work so I wouldn't get raped into work. Is that how dangerous it was then? And it's worse today. And I went in there and my boys, I'm convinced the place was a front of the mafia. And after working for a while, I thought, I better get out of here because this boy, he's just got bad enough cover. He might kill somebody. It just might be me. And it's not very safe. There was a big thing at Watts at the time. And Martin Luther King was murdered. And I mean, it was just, things were up in an uproar. And I thought, I want to have children anyway. So I left. But I couldn't stand leaving these women behind. They 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 didn't have the design skills I had. So while they could sew, because they were being cross-trained, which is not always the case in the fact that they were, they didn't have the design skills they needed to start cottage industry. And I decided to write down the skills I had learned for them. It's now 30 years later, and I finally looks like I'm going to get a chance to interact with these people is probably their descendants at this point because love them 30 years 30 40 years ago actually 50 years ago I think, a long time ago but i still am motivated to try and help philadelphia we've got too many people who need hope and we have tremendous talent in, in philadelphia tremendous fashion talent and design ability i saw it in the factories i know it's there but they need the basic skills they need these this basic information that i can teach them and i want to enable them to realize their talents and that's what i want to do and it looks like silicon is going to give me that chance and i'm really really excited about it. right now i'm making myself outfits so i can walk in and show them what they will be able to do once they learn these skills that's what i'm doing that is so awesome. When you call yourself a fashion educator, I think this is what that means. And I said to yep. all the fashionistas out there, if you want to learn how to make your own fashions, you know, fashions with Laurel is definitely the, the way to go. So, but that sounds like a very passionate project. You know, would, yes. would you say your, your journey, I mean, we all have businesses for different reasons. Some want to go out and make a lot of money. Some just want to go make an impact. Others are okay with, with having kind of a hobby that brings in some income, but the main, the, the main driving force is really making that impact. I Which want would the world you say to see what have? Philadelphia can do. I want the world to see what Philadelphia can do. This is my city. Grant and I grew up in South Jersey, which, by the way, is below the Mason-Dixon line where I grew up. So I consider myself a Southerner. And many of the women I worked with had come up from the South, further South than I did, and moved into the city to try and realize their dreams. And I, I, I'm driven to do this. I don't know why, but I just am. When I went off to Syracuse, I came up I came came off a farm and everybody was dressed to the nines back then you know it was everybody was going for their MRS degree and I was going for a career and I had my clothes were shabby because they were homemade and I was so embarrassed and I thought to myself then I'm gonna learn how to sew so well that I never have to be embarrassed by my clothes again and I've achieved that dream there are many people that do not have access to the information I have and do not have much money and are in the same situation I was in. Clothes matter. When you're dressed well, you get a better seat at the table. You're more likely to get hired. You get offered more money. You're more likely to get somebody interested in marrying you. There's all sorts of assets for some decent clothing. And everybody wears clothes. And I want to make this available to other people who, like myself, back way back when, need some help. Will it make money? In the end, it may. I mean, I what I wrote is textbooks, but can I sell them? No, because the people teaching in the colleges and universities, by and large, know home sewing. I don't think many of them even realize the industry is using a different method. The sample makers in the industry have no college, so they're not asked to teach in college. The kids graduate, and most of them cannot get jobs in the industry because they have so much to unlearn that it's easier just to train off the street. Kenny will not hire anybody that has a fashion degree. This is a fact and it's very sad. It doesn't have to be that way. So let's talk about client generation. You know, there are people out there at the end of the day, it's all about converting customers. It's about reaching that right person that you're trying to make a difference with. And, you know, 
convincing them with your message that this is the route to work with you to take your courses? How are you um, finding your ideal target audience? What type of things are you doing out there that you could suggest to other people that is working? Not much of anything. Quite frankly, I need some information on that. Be perfectly honest. Um, I did find them when I taught in college because I had continuing professional ed and I was having students come in from the various design departments here in Philadelphia and others who wanted, who were, it, it attracted career women, which was a surprise to me. That seems to be the market is career women. Uh, most of them had at least one degree. Many had doctorates that were coming in. I had doctors and lawyers. So they wanted so to career clothing and they couldn't get them in the stores. And that's who came in. Um, but the colleges, um, I left one college because things turned around. It wasn't very pleasant. I, I mean, I was subject to a lot of politics because I knew it and the others knew I knew it and they knew that I knew that many of them didn't know it and wasn't very pleasant. Um, and then uh, where I was, the second place where I taught in college, I'm not going to name colleges because I don't really want to smear their names, but I, they had me teaching over in the attic of their main building so that their degree students would know about me. I mean, that's what I was up against. So I really think that the goal here is, is if I'm successful in Philadelphia with the teenagers at Philly Cam, let's face it, they're a TV station, that that's going to draw other people too. When, they, when people see the success these teenagers will be able to achieve, they're going to think again, and they're going to be interested in what I have. But at the present time, home selling books sell, and they're being used as a textbook. I'm up against the big corporations, the big publishers. They're making all kinds of money. And the uh, professors want to teach home selling because that's what they know. And I, there are plenty of pattern makers in the industry who, by the way, don't know sample making. Now, I don't know how you can draft patterns and not know how it's going to be sewn together. But it probably a good 50% of all pattern makers in the fashion industry do not know sample making. They have sample makers even do their own personal sewing in, on, on the job sometimes. So that's the situation we're in. I mean, this is information the world needs and doesn't have. So I understand that write it. Hmm? having, you know, having books and being able to reach that audience to get your word out about what you do and the impact you can make and the courses you have to teach people, you have to be able to reach them and, and get that book out there. You may not have the marketing dollars, but there are unique ways. And I'm wondering, are you trying to maybe reach those people digitally on, you know, social media, letting people know about something they they have no idea about, Laurel. You, I mean, you you are the one who kind of is on this cutting edge thing, and people don't know what they don't know, right? That's and right. And so I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering how you're reaching those people to get the word out, besides no, just on, word of mouth. I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm not really getting anywhere. I mean, it's, this is a very hard market to convince. And uh, I taught, I had 4-H club and the 4-H club was able to finish 10, what normally takes 10 years in three before they were even in the senior level. I wrote to um, the, the Department of Agriculture because they head up 4-H for their head up the extension service and 4-H is part of that the youth division. I didn't get any response. I wrote to Dr. Jill Biden. I got a formal form. That was it. Uh, I just don't get anywhere with anybody. And I think the only way I'm going to get anywhere is if I teach these teenagers and Philadelphia proves that this really works. And then it's going to make people begin to notice. And I think that's what I have to do. I think I have to really go at the part, the, the denial, like Moses did, to get anybody to pay any attention. I mean, that's what I'm really up against. I'm against, up against a real battle. And... Um, Quite frankly, I just finished the last book back in the spring. So eight books took me 30 years to write. This all had to be classroom tested. Everything is to scale. It all had to be so people could understand it easily. I had the perfect test market. I had these, these, um, these professional women, many of whom did writing for in their jobs. And I said to them, tell me what you don't understand. I can't read these books the way you do. I know this, but you, you, you're in here to learn it. Tell me. And in the beginning, they were a little bit nervous about it. And I didn't like hearing their comments, but I shut up and made it look like I was really happy. And I got used to it. And then when people would tell me what's wrong, I said, oh, thank you so much. Because 
this really is worthwhile. If you can take criticism from other people, you've got the advantage of not just your own mind, but everybody else's mind as well. Let's face it, five minds can come up with a lot better group of ideas than just one mind. And um, so all through my books, I look at them and I remember, oh, so-and-so said this and so-and-so suggested this. And, you know, it's like having this conglomeration of readers, many of whom were actually working in the industry. So that's what's in the book. And they do really work. But I've got to convince people. And I think the only way is by example. So, and let's face it, Hillary Cam is a TV studio. It's granted its community, but they're connected the, through the whole country with other community TVs. Nice. And we've just won a national award. And um, the, uh, then my son and I were just recently in a, a video festival, film festival in Bethlehem. And we were part of the panel and I'm talking to the congregation there about what we're doing. They were clapping. They were thrilled to death to hear about what's happening because anyone that's anywhere near Philadelphia is very, very concerned about all the drive by shootings and all the misery. We want something. We want better lives for our fellow people here in the city. Now, I'm not in the city. I'm right on the suburbs, but I consider myself to be a member of the city. I love Philadelphia. So tell me, you have this huge opportunity then to get in front of people and make them aware of yes. what, what you are doing. Tell me the strategy of taking that information and making it public because that, that is going to be great in itself, but you're going to have to get the word out there that this is going on. This is like a, a fabulous thing. How do you plan on using that as like publicity or marketing, or do you have a, a strategy for that? Well, I'm on your show <laughs> at the beginning. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I We're on uh, YouTube. Uh, we're picking up followers. I'm on Instagram, as a matter of fact, as I'm making these outfits um, to wear when I teach, I am taking uh, shots with my iPhone and putting them up on Instagram every night, every, every so often, one or one or two a day, so people can watch me sewing and people are interested. And you know, I'm doing the best I can. I thought people would be crazy for this that I would have no problem selling this at all. But I send in proposals to the book publishers and they're not interested because what sells is home selling. Home selling is off the charts. I know selling home selling methods. I know all of them. I don't use them. Why would I use them? Why would I use something that takes me three times as long and I don't get anywhere with it? When I can use industrial methods, I start out with an idea. I know how to proceed right on through it. It's all in my books. And when I'm done, I've got something I couldn't possibly afford to buy. I mean, we're not poor, but the kind of clothes I make. One time I was up in New York and I went into um, Coco Chanel's boutique and nobody was there. And so I'm talking to the guy that's in charge and he seemed to take a real interest in me. And he brought out the sample book to show me what clothes they had for sale. And there was a blouse in there similar to one I'm wearing now, and it was $1,000, and this was at least 15 years ago. Wow. I mean, why wouldn't yeah. you want $1,000 blouses in your closet? I mean, <laughs> if, you can buy, if you can make them for, say, $5. <laughs> now, have you thought about, or, or maybe you already have your books, are you selling them on Amazon, where you could direct people right now to go ahead and pick up a book? You have it on your website. Can you tell people where they could get a book? Right. Well, they can get them on my website. And as a matter of fact, the first five people who order a book after this show is over will get a free book as well. All right. So any book you order, you'll also get a copy of the very last book I just finished. And the name of it is a, a, a telling, telling a Woman's Jacket. And in it are the procedures that are used by Jones of New York to make their best jackets. Now, I can't say in the book that's the case, but it is. And why do I know that? Because my very close friend, Carolyn Ramsey, who was one of their top production pattern makers, worked for Jones. And she knew how they did it because she worked on their patterns. 
And I said to her years ago, Carolyn, tell me how Jones does their jackets. And she told me, and I put it in the book. Now, it took me forever to get this book finished because others were more important at the time. They were needed more by my students. And But this book was just finished. This is the last of the eighth book, and it's done. And uh, you'll get a free copy of that. The first five people that order books for me. And go on my website. It's www. Well, you know, it's Laurel Hoffman, L-A-U-R-E-L-H-O-F-F-M-A-N-N.com. It'll come right up. And the books are right on the front first page. And if you're interested, you can go on my blog. Is I've got over oh, 150 or more posts. You, you, what might be of real interest to everybody is to go on my blog and look at the posts about sustainable clothing, how to reduce the amount of clothes you need and have a very effective wardrobe. It all is based on Tell Me Beautiful. You need to know your own power palette. And it will eliminate a lot of clothes from your closet you're not wearing anyway. And when you go shopping, you'll know what to buy. And if you're not sure, talk to strangers. Strangers give you all kinds of information. I always talk to strangers. I mean, it's amazing what you learn from people you don't know. And say, how does this look? How does this fabric look on me? Is this a good print for me? Is this a good color? And they will tell you. Now, yeah. once in a while, they'll tell you wrong. But most people will tell you right. And you'll come home with fabric that you'll want to wear, you want to sew up. Even if you keep it for 10 years and you got a chance around to do it, because that's what I'm doing. I'm digging out fabric that I've had for years and I'm sewing it up and really happy with the results. So, but I need very few clothes, very few. Everything coordinates back and forth. And um, yeah. I have a closet. If any of you grown up on a farm, you know about outhouses. All right. I have a closet the size of one whole outhouse. That's it. Now, there was a pole that went straight across. So it, you only really had access to about you know like right from the door in i had my husband take that pole down and put two poles on either side and uh, that gave me four poles and that gave me four times the storage space but it's still a tiny little closet and i don't need any more space i got every time something comes up i think what am i going to wear what should i make I go in the closet there's always something i don't need to make anything and by the way while you're planning your wardrobe Think about funerals. A funeral always comes up when you least expect it. Have something in your closet ready for a funeral. And the secret to having a great wardrobe is the four-piece go-anywhere wardrobe, go-anywhere outfit. So you get the basic color that's very good for you. For instance, maybe a light navy or, in my case, a dark navy. Make a jacket, a skirt, a pair of slacks, and a blouse. Four pieces. Now. You've got the outfit for a funeral, but you've also got an outfit you can mix and match with everything else in your closet. So if you're not going to a funeral, you still can use this outfit. And that's my suggestion. And that's what I do. I always set up with a set and then mix them back, back and forth. That is great advice. Well, Laurel, I have so enjoyed all of your knowledge today. And I, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. And for all of our guests out there, and for those of you who are watching the replay, think about uh, Laurel's offer that the first five people who contact her on her website get a copy of um, her free book with every book, I guess, that they purchase. So, um, by, by the way, one other thing. If you put in show, S-H-O-W, when you check out, you'll get a 20% off on whatever you buy. Awesome. Okay, so go ahead, get... A book and then you'll get her latest one for free and i guess you're getting 20 percent off too so if you right. put in the word show so everybody please go ahead and and uh show laurel some love being the entrepreneur she's being and she is probably one of the most energetic ones and i i would say the word intuitive i think is it is very strong and having a strong instinct um, about things so Everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. And again, we will be back next week with another rock star having a rock star conversation about their journey into entrepreneurship that I hope you can pick up just pieces that can help you with your journey. And if you, right, if you right now are doing a lot of marketing in your business, and even if you have a strong online presence and you are still not converting customers, 
you don't have a marketing problem, you have a messaging problem. So reach out to me about how to convert customers simply by going back and redefining your target audience, how you change their lives, how you do it differently than anybody else out there, and let's put it together in a message that resonates and is relevant. So 8simplesteps.net is where you can reach me and of course on all these socials. We will be back next week and I wanna say thank you so much to everybody tuning in and Laurel, thanks for being an amazing entrepreneur and amazing guest. Good night, everybody. Good night, great, thank you.